Dear attendees, thank you for your participation in our previous sessions and welcome to our 12th International Conference for Teachers of English Language Teaching during COVID-19. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of our guest speakers, Dr. Erika Saito. Dr. Erika Saito is an assistant professor and course lead in the Masters in Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, and Masters in Education with an SEL emphasis at National University Sanford College of Education. She teaches research in SEL and SEL action research methods for educators. Prior National University, Dr. Saito taught in Pepperdine University's MA TESOL program and teacher credentialing candidates in teaching English learners. Dr. Saito's background includes over 15 years as a pre-K through 12 classroom teacher, literacy teacher on special assignment, and ELD sheltered programs department chair in both public and private institutions in Southern California. Dr. Saito's research is published in Teachers College Record, School Community Journal, The Family Journal, and Berkeley Review of Education. She is currently K-12 level chair for CATISO, secretary-elect for Area's SEL Special Interest Group, associate editor for Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies in Education, and article editor for Issues in Teacher Education. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Erika Saito. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and I thank all of you for joining me today and welcome. With our states or our world in this state of unknowns, being able to reflect upon these past two years in the ways that we have transformed education during COVID has also brought forth this need that was always a concern um, pre-COVID within the area of social emotional learning. So the field of SEL, has been around for about three decades now, and it took COVID to bring this area to the forefront of education. Today, I'm pleased to share some practices along with research in the SEL field. I also want to preface this by saying that this is inclusive of all classrooms. It's not limited to ESOL by any means. Um, and in fact, the research in SEL within ESOL classrooms during COVID is, is very sparse. So I'm actually going to be talking mostly about the broader landscape of education. But before we begin, I would like to thank the conference committee and the National Pedagogic University Francisco Morazan and the US Department of State for allowing me to be here today. I am truly grateful for this opportunity and I hope that I can share some helpful information with all of you. I think that's, that's the biggest part. So um, just a, an outline for today and going back to what I mentioned before uh, regarding social emotional learning during COVID, I'd like to start this presentation by introducing you to a warm welcome and creating a brave space for discussion. This will lead into my attempt in defining this really broad term of social emotional learning through some of the larger known SEL frameworks and understanding the SEL context. We will then move into SEL in application during the pandemic, what adults can do to navigate their emotions during this challenging time, and how it can be promoted within our classrooms, um, and then at the end, leaving you with an optimistic closure. So I'm curious to know from all of you how you're feeling at this exact moment. If you could rate your feelings right now on a scale of one to five, with one being happy and calm and five being furious or enraged, what number or word describes you? So feel free to share it in the chat. The scale that, that I have here is called a temperature check and it's used to quickly gauge students' emotions as they enter the classroom or even in an online space like this one. Oftentimes we don't ask each of our students how they're feeling every single day um, or sometimes we wait, we wait until the end of the school day or the end of the class to ask questions about how they're feeling. And by then it might be too late, right? If you wait till the end of the day, the end of your class, you're already seeing the misbehaviors that have occurred that could have been addressed at the beginning. 
So this is used as a quick, very quick check um, and preventative measure. So this image is something that I just created. I just made a table, found some images, added some words, um, but you can find other examples online and adapt it. So this can be used, of course, in an online space. Um, students can type in the number of how they're feeling. They can put in the emoji of how they're feeling. They can type in a word of how they're feeling in a chat box. You can decide if it needs to be sent publicly or privately. That's up to you. Um, but being able to self-identify these feelings and being acknowledged for having these feelings or supporting our students' self-awareness. This is a very quick and easy do, uh, daily practice that you can implement so easily. And I'll share a few variations of this in a minute. So for in-person instruction, it can be a poster on a wall. You can have sticky notes and students can come in and just put their name and attach it to a point on their temperature check. Um, they could use their photos as a check-in. It could be a tiny slip of paper where students just write their name and the number. So there's so many ways to, to you know, modify this quick and easy step. Um, but these vocabulary feeling words can also change throughout the year. It could turn into a journal prompt to describe and expand upon why they feel this way. But it, it is something that is important that we need to acknowledge with our students. So here are some other ways that you could begin a class with a warm welcome. The image here on the right is a mood meter, and it was developed by Mark Brackett. So you could see there's a, a large range of words here. His work looks at widening one's emotional vocabulary. This can be great for all students to attach more accurate terms to the emotions they are feeling. And this is based on, and it's hard to see, and I'm sorry about this at the bottom, by the levels of pleasantness, as well as the levels of energy. It's also color coded to make it easier to identify the words to match their feelings. I've had teachers take this and adapt it into other languages to widen their students vocabulary in other languages. Um, so using the mood meter, are there more accurate words that you're that describe how you're feeling right now compared to the temperature check? All of these types of check ins and these happen at the beginning of class allow students to name the feeling expand their emotional vocabulary, the mood meter and um, the temperature check, it really helps develop their language. And this is for all students, right? Even if you are a native English speaker and you're learning these vocabulary words, for a lot of people, it's also new. Another form of check-in that can be used is a Google form. Um, and I've used this in classrooms as well as a quick check-in. You can monitor it very easily. Of course, it should be at the beginning of the day. Uh, it could also be at the, you could also, you know, adapt it and do one at the beginning, one at the end of the day. But outside of these quick check-ins are these year-long community building supports that can help foster a positive classroom climate. An example of this are morning meetings. A morning meeting or a class meeting um, starts at the beginning of the day or beginning of class where the teacher holds a discussion on topics tied to SEL. So this could include a thematic topic such as the word of the week, and it can be incorporated into stories tied to that word, how it connects to students' lives, and how they are applying it within the classroom. A morning meeting can be brief, but should be consistent and held consistently throughout the year. Morning meetings promote so self and social awareness as well as relationship building. So beginning each day with a warm welcome, again, can be something really brief, really easy to include into the classroom. Um, and, it, and morning meetings also promote health, healthy relationships and social emotional skills that, again, include the self-awareness, social awareness, relationship building, a sense of belonging, and empathy. So this is another area, and I've, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about safe spaces. And I wanted to introduce uh, creating a brave space. When we're creating a space for critical dialogue, particularly in our classrooms, especially when we're online, it's important to discuss this topic of brave spaces. In social justice work, the term brave space was described by Brian Ario and Christy Clemens in their chapter on From Safe to Brave Spaces. 
It is establishing ground rules collectively with your students. Um, and it is important to hold before you have a class discussion or any type of dialogue. The recommendations for facilitating a brave space include controversy with civility. So this means that participants can engage in conversation and this can include a disagreement, but you should also identify the source or the issue as well as the problems or possible solutions. One thing that I would stress is avoid saying the phrase, oh, well, I guess we agree to disagree. When we say things like that, we're reinforcing one person's dominance over another, and it just stops or ends the conversation without a resolution. The second thing to remember is owning intentions and impact. So this refers to the things that are said or intended to mean, but they don't always align with the impact. So we say things sometimes and it, it doesn't come out the right way or you know, there's always some sort of miscommunication. Challenge by choice means it's up to the individual to decide the level of part participation one engages in, as well as whether or not an individual would like to participate at all. And I know that can be challenging, especially in a language classroom where you want to hear everyone participate 100% of the time. But in situations where you're having critical dialogue, we have to be sensitive to students' emotions, whether or not it triggers um, a re-traumatization. So we need to be conscious of, of the space that we're providing the and the topics that we're including. Next is being respectful and be respective. But it's also being aware of the cultural nuances and what respect looks like and what it sounds like, because it may be different. And of course, and I know this seems so obvious, but no attacks, no blatant disrespect. Instead, hold a clarifying conversation. So as we started our warm opening and setting some expectations for critical dialogue, I'm finally starting the presentation with defining social emotional learning. It's, a, it's such a huge word. So I made this visual and I started typing in all these different words of, you know, that I could brainstorm. Um, but, and there's so many words attached to social emotional learning. It's also referred to as SEL. And depending on the context, we could call it emotional intelligence, non-cognitive skills, developmental assets, character skills. Um, I heard in one presentation, 21st century skills, interpersonal skills, among others. But ultimately, social emotional learning is centered on emotional development. And while there is no single definition that encapsulates all of what SEL is and does, I will try to define it as a, as a human developmental process. Um, it is my belief that it begins in infancy and continues throughout one's life. As we encounter a range of adverse situations, our response to them changes. SEL is also tied to our relationships, the way we manage our emotions, and how we identify ethnically, spiritually, by our age, our professions, our gender, our race. So it's everything. SEL is such a broad term, and it's applied to everything we do and think, even at a subconscious level. So why does SEL matter? Why does it matter? <laughs> Well, it's an important aspect of our overall well-being. Social emotional development, as mentioned earlier, continues throughout our lifespan, and it's largely shaped by our experiences and how we respond to them. In a broader sense, incorporating um, the teaching of SEL in a classroom or organizational setting is a preventative measure to assist us when we are facing adverse situations. Having social emotional skills leads to positive social adjustment and well being, which in a school setting, it means it positively impacts academic achievement. So, SEL includes building relations. These are the relations that um, students have between other students, students and adults, and even between adults. Relations extend to areas such as empathy, as well as understanding and respecting others' cultures. A greater piece, I believe, is the area of self-awareness. We are all experiencing the challenges of our society, whether it's tied to racial justice, COVID-19, or other areas that have impacted our lives. SEL helps in the process of facing our societal realities. This, in turn, also promotes our resilience in facing these situations. In the US, 
and this might look familiar to some people, in the US, the most commonly referred um, SEL framework is CASEL's framework. And CASEL stands for Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. Uh, the framework and the term social and emotional learning it was actually coined by CASEL researchers about 30 some years ago. And they've recently revised their framework. So some, some of the components down at the bottom were, were added in just this past year. So this is a K-12 school-centered framework that focuses primarily on social emotional competencies developed in classrooms and schools. The four key settings are where SEL takes place and develops. This includes the classroom where SEL can and should be explicitly taught and modeled, the school, which includes school-wide culture, practices, and policies. And between these two settings, it's important to consider whether SEL is happening in one class out of this entire school, or if it's implemented school-wide. Having the congruency between classroom and school would be ideal to promote social emotional development. Um, families and caregivers, communities are key settings, but within this framework, they're off, often seen as partnered and aligned rather than leveraged to promote social emotional learning. So these following five competencies are focused in classrooms and schools for social emotional development. The emphasis of CASEL competencies focus on interpersonal skills. Um, I've embedded some of these terms and added my own definitions of, to them. And I've, I know I've talked about some of these terms within the previous slides um, as we were looking at the temperature checks and the morning meetings for building relationships. But my own understanding of these CASEL competencies can be transformed further into the ways our identity informs our relations, our beliefs within social justice, and how they shape our decision-making process. So I do have some other further information that I could share with you. Um, I co-authored a piece on creating brave spaces in social justice and social emotional learning in language learner classrooms that just came out this year. And I, I, maybe I could share it later or somewhere at the end. So, so I just shared CASEL's framework. Um, it's largely, again, centered on this K-12 space with students in schools. I also wanted to take a moment to briefly introduce a few other social and emotional frameworks that, it, that include adult development, and they're not limited to school settings. So here is the Clover model, which is characterized by its four domains. It looks supposed to look like a clover, it doesn't really look like one though, um, that represents the human developmental process beginning in infancy and continuing into adulthood. It is sometimes referred to as a developmental process theory, and there are four distinct domains that are attributed to four developmental periods. So early childhood, middle childhood, early, early adolescence, and late adolescence. So active engagement is speci a specialized area in early childhood, okay? And it continues throughout their development. It's defined as this physical connection to the world around them. This includes understanding our bodies, moving, maybe physical activities, playtime, sports, and later on leads into to other physical activities. Um, and then there's this other piece of assertiveness which is specialized in middle childhood. And it's defined as having agency, negotiating with oneself and with others, and also understanding the decision-making process. So this transitions later in life to developing one's voice and position, being able to express opinions and beliefs. And this can be supported by offering students within these age ranges choices. So choice to, to feel that sense of independence um, and also decision making. Belonging or belongingness is a specialization within early adolescence and it's tied to relationship building with peers and adults, also group and identity. In a classroom, this could be supported and I just heard this in the last presentation about working in pairs or working in groups. Um, and this is to create connections so something like having clubs, um, participating in class would be another thing to consider. And the fourth is reflection, which is a specialization in late adolescence. 
is defined as creating or making sense of one's experiences, their decisions, and identity. And this can be supported in the classroom through structured time that allows for reflection and can easily be done through something like journaling. So think about um, the opportunities for your youth and being able to share the insights you want to, you want to have them express. While a focus or what is described as the specialization within each of these time period occurs, the four domains continuously overlap. So even though it says early childhood here, it's not like it only happens during early childhood, right? It, it continuously occurs throughout time. But what makes this model different is that it does not rely on a curriculum or on school instruction, but it just aligns with this whole process of social emotional development and human development. So I have two more, and um, I know these are all so different. There's actually, there's, there's several frameworks that exist, um, but I was trying to like, consider some that include adults, since most of us are adults here, I think. Um, so while there are numerous SEL frameworks and programs that exist, the bulk of these frameworks, again, center on this um, pre-K-12 setting. Uh, for those that have adult SEL frameworks, they often combine these with as a, like a grade level. And even in more recent SEL frameworks, adults are still in school, but they could be considered as part of a college framework or a career readiness framework. Um, and so these fr two frameworks include adults. The first is the big five, and this has been around for decades, the big five personality traits also known as the five factor model or the ocean model. It centers on emotions and personality dimensions and behaviors. So these adjectives were identified by personality psychologists to describe the personality dimensions that align with health, educational outcomes and careers. This other one on the right, an ACT might sound very familiar with all of you um, because it's widely known for their standardized college entrance exam. And in the past five to six years, they've come into the SEL field with the ACT Holistic Framework of Education and Work Readiness. This framework extends from early childhood through adulthood, and this was created due to the changing demands of college entrance requirements and understanding the ways colleges prepare students for their careers. So um, some of these areas include cross-cutting capability ranges, um, from technological literacy, problem solving, behavioral skills, and being able to manage um, stress, working well with others, and then things with education, career navigation, and just having the knowledge and understanding of their majors, understanding career paths, and making the appropriate decisions to, to get towards that career. So now that I've provided an overview to some existing SEL frameworks, um, you can find some connections across all of these, in spite of the difference in the settings or in the target ages. When looking at how, at how to apply an SEL framework internationally, it's important to understand the ranging definitions and how the competencies are translated within each country's context and culture. Consideration of the intended population should serve as a starting point and defining the com components of social emotional learning that align with cultural norms before placing it in application. Do the ages and stages of human development align with the cultural human de development ages and stages? Further is the consideration of what is valued as an outcome. Is it well being or is it academic success? Maybe it's both. Other pieces to consider when choosing an SEL framework for your school sites, your classroom, or even for yourself, is that it's not something that someone like me can enforce upon you or your classroom community. As educators, as adults, we must pull from our own understandings of our community context. So we need to ask ourselves, who are the students in my classroom and what best represents my students' community? What do I understand as a need to help them develop into responsible citizens? What are their cultural beliefs and values that I can build upon and connect to what already exists? How are the terms being used, understood by my students? Is there any clarification needed in the way that is used or being internalized? 
The other side of this are the instructional practices. As English educators, it's important for us to understand the varying cultures and backgrounds that we serve. How are we aligning our instructional practices in SEL to also reflect and honor our students' cultures? How are we engaging and acknowledging the backgrounds of our students in the classroom to develop SEL competencies? Much of this stems from us as educators being in touch with our societal realities, with knowing and being comfortable right, with ourselves and embodying these SEL qualities, engaging in critical self-reflection, addressing our own biases and assumptions of our students. All of this is to continuously improve our profession, right, our professional selves and our SEL practice. So there isn't like a space where it just says, you know, this is what SEL should look like for adults. But so this is my opinion largely, but an ideal framework for adult SEL should be inclusive of the culture and setting of one's environment, as I mentioned just earlier. For adults, the key setting could be in a workplace. It could be home or any other area where the adults interact. Currently, the role of adults in SEL frameworks is relational. I mentioned earlier that some, some adult SEL things are frameworks are in a school setting um, where we're like described as a college student or adults are included as imparting and teaching SEL competencies. Um, but in, and so I do want to acknowledge that adults are impacting social emotional development of our students in the classroom, in the home, in our school settings, home settings. Um, but, but the previous frameworks I shared do not include adults like as if it's as if once you're in college that's the end of your social emotional learning development because that's the end of the framework right and to me it's a continuous process because what happens if we finish college what happens if we're not in college you know does it mean that we don't have any social emotional learning um so i i want to consider how it can be looked at beyond these school settings or even career readiness settings I, I don't believe it just stops, right? I mean, we're all we're all facing different situations right now. We're all trying to build our own social emotional pathway. So my belief is that it continues regardless of whether you're in school. Um, to provide some further context, I also wanted to share what was happening pre-COVID. Because you know, we jumped into COVID and now we're saying, oh my goodness, we need social emotional learning. Well, what happened pre-COVID? You know, was it even was it even a thing? Um, in 2019, there was there were an increasing number of teachers who described levels high levels of stress. Okay, stress, anxiety, all tied to their jobs and higher rates of attrition. Social emotional learning for educators has been connected with increasing rates of teacher retention and improvement in job satisfaction. Teachers with SEL skills are better able to manage their emotions, therefore impacting the interactions they have with their students and improvement in teacher-student relations. The way teachers feel impacts their teaching and as a result, it impacts student learning. Teachers who are better equipped with SEL competencies are positively impacting their students' achievement. So this was something that we understood before COVID. Okay, something we understood. Pre-COVID, not only were these increased feelings of teacher anxiety, teacher stress, and attrition, but there were also self-reports of their beliefs in improving their students' SEL competencies. However, these teachers also felt that there were factors outside of school that had a greater influence than what they could do in the classroom. A majority of teachers also felt there was a greater need or pressure to improve achievement versus focusing on SEL. But what they probably didn't know from all of this is that developing social emotional learning in the classroom is a factor in raising academic achievement and decreasing behavioral issues. So these are some things pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, the majority of teachers received SEL professional development but noted that the PDs did not provide ways to adapt SEL into different cultural or linguistic backgrounds, as well as using SEL data. As mentioned in that previous study, teachers' well-being is positively associated with the emphasis on SEL practices 
in spite of teachers serving in communities of varying poverty levels, only small differences were found with teacher well being in these schools. Another area that I'd like to note is that elementary teachers reported higher levels of school support for SEL compared to secondary teachers. There could be a range of factors that include less time in the classroom, right? Once you get to secondary school or you can go to high school. Um, but also teachers and students, they need, they still continue, right? We're still continuing to progress. So they definitely need to have that support. And right now adults are experiencing a range of emotions and experiences that maybe we've never encountered before. We're all trying to navigate this space and we need to find supports that work for us. So imagine what our students are going through right now who lack all of these supports. Um, and I will go into this more in my second presentation tomorrow that focuses on post-pandemic and trauma-informed practices. COVID-19, so this is during COVID, COVID-19 has raised issues of educational equity that I will also be addressing in a little bit more depth in my next presentation, but I wanna share a few points here. The impact from COVID includes the digital divide. And we've heard this before, which refers to student access to technology, but it also impacted instructional practices. As so many teachers transitioned without prior online training or experience, right, with technology. And this also impacted student learning. Schools were not prioritizing student needs. Instead, schools decided what they felt worked best based on their conditions of program access and staffing in an online space. And lastly is SEL support. So COVID, COVID raised mental health concerns that existed prior to COVID for teachers and students, but created a more urgent awareness as a result of being isolated, having limited connections with peers and adults, and the devastation of death of loved ones. During COVID, state education agencies in the US identified SEL as a priority with a need to address mental health, trauma, and anxiety. When looking at these percentages of mental health and academics, the priority by state education agencies is overwhelmingly focused on SEL needs. In a nationwide study of, state, of these state agencies, 31 states in the US out of 50 <laughs> described SEL as an increased priority. 78% of states agencies mentioned district requests for SEL has increased since the start of COVID. So we are seeing this need during COVID. We're seeing how powerful it could be to help our students. Um, and I think this quote really helps summarize it best. Schools are more effective at teaching and reinforcing SEL for students when they also cultivate SEL competencies in adults. And I cannot stress enough how often adults are left out of the picture. So I understand that as educators, you know, we need to teach the SEL competencies, we need to embody these qualities. Um, but there's this other side, like what about us? You know, what about our self-care? Uh, and I'll go into this in a little bit as well. Adult SEL, and I, I keep saying this because it's true, it just has not been explored as much. Um, it's this growing area that's coming out right now as a result of the pandemic. And, and I, I know I keep saying it's this developmental process. We're still trying to figure out how to manage our feelings and emotions. And it's, I, I believe we'll, we'll get there. We'll definitely get there. Um, but what we do know is that our students are impacted by us. They're impacted by our own development. Castle understands the necessity for SEL and adults in order for students to be better equipped in managing their emotions and making responsible choices. So these are top priorities and challenges that were identified by educators during COVID. So the top three priorities identified by educators includes addressing mental health needs, including trauma and anxiety. The second is supporting adults, SEL and mental health. So there you go. And the third is providing supporting professional learning on SEL. The top challenges in SEL being a priority is largely based on the issues with training, training staff at schools, districts and agency levels. And, and that was identified as the top two challenges. The third is tied between a focus on academics, 
protecting funds for SEL, and difficulty with SEL distance learning strategies. So we can see how important this is, especially the need for adults, right, adult SEL. And then internationally, COVID, of course, it did impact education. It raised this need for social emotional um, development and mental health supports, and then the transition back to in-person learning across all countries, all socioeconomic levels. Um, however, the levels of engagement between students and teachers really varied based on income level. And this is this could be predictable, right? You just can imagine this in your head, the, the amount of resources that one place might have over another. Um, and and it's it affected the modalities of teaching, the connections that teachers had with students and parents and families right, is is based largely on on income and access. So what can we do as adults to understand and navigate our own social emotional development and one thing that I cannot emphasize enough is self care. So self care, I don't want you to confuse it with self indulgence. This doesn't mean like I want to go shopping and spend all my money and eat tons of chocolate. Okay, that's not self care. Self care is really looking at healthy habits across a range of areas. And I, I'm sorry to say this, but I will be talking about this uh, a self care plan in the in the next presentation. But but self care will cover these these areas: physical, mental emotional, social, spiritual, and professional, okay? So you can reflect upon these different areas. Um, think about what you're currently doing, possible roadblocks, things that might get in your way you know, of your goal. And it's important to, to stick this somewhere. So like I keep little sticky notes and post-it notes, so you can't really see it, um, with me at all times. I like to post things everywhere. And this is a really good strategy. It's a good strategy to just remind yourself of something. It could be a quote. It could be something you're supposed to be doing that day. Um, so, so having those little mental notes is really helpful. Another SEL practice that we can engage in as adults is listening. And I know this seems so obvious to so many people, and maybe that's why it's, it's an area within social emotional learning that is less described at all, um, but it supports equitable practices. So I have here a different list of types of listening. And as adults, active listening is an important piece of fostering relationships. And we're modeling these listening practices for our students. These require the full attention of participants. In some cases, we're timing speaking to allow for equitable voice without interruptions, without any judgment. So constructivist listening provides space for reflection, provides space for releasing emotions and constructing new meaning about whatever challenges they face. It provides pairs or small groups of up to five and includes timed listening without any distractions. So no looking at your cell phone, no typing into the chat, it's full attention towards that person, okay? And I think this is a really great practice because when you actually put students into a group and you ask them to speak for three minutes, one at a time without any interruptions, it can be challenging, right? But you're at least you're creating the space, you're creating an equitable opportunity. Sometimes there are students that wanna talk but they just feel like they don't have the opportunity to talk because there's that one person that likes to talk the most. So this creates, like you're creating the setting for them that feels safe, right? That feels like they can speak. Um, and for adults, this works well too. I've tried it with, with other teachers. It's hard at first, but I strongly encourage it. For Spectrum is another one, uh, which, which also offers the space and the time speaking. But in this case, it's it comes up with like a problem. So the first person will speak, they'll talk about their problem, everyone listens, they take notes, they're not speaking or interrupting, and then they take time to reflect. Um, and this is another structured way of holding a conversation or a discussion with equitable time. And then active listening is something that you probably have done or, you know, something that sometimes is natural to some people. Um, but you can set ground rules of what this looks like and what it sounds like. If you have one person that's speaking, you know that they're listening because the participants are asking questions. 
Um, the participants are responding, making connections to their own experiences. You know, they're reflecting on something. So that's how you know someone's listening, right? And then there's the reflective listening, which is more of an empathetic move. Um, and it's to acknowledge what, what the speaker is feeling. So one of the key considerations when implementing SEL in any classroom is to understand that you don't need to go out there and buy you know, a, a program. You don't need to buy one at all. It can be a very simple change in your instructional practice. There are ways to implement SEL through explicit instruction across content areas, and it should be, again, consistent daily. It should offer opportunities for students to engage and express their feelings and emotions. Ask students what would help them during this time. You'll be surprised by the small adjustments and recommendations they provide. And you can think creatively about how you can uh, realistically support them, as well as your educational and SEL goals. I do want to stress this last little piece, which are the kernels of practice. So you think of like a kernel, like a, a corn kernel from Stephanie Jones at Harvard's Easel Lab. They've identified these key areas, low cost, low burden, SEL implementation done internationally. And it's proven to be effective in international settings. So it's something realistic, something flexible, something that could be easily added in, like I showed you the temperature check, right? Super quick, super easy. Something as simple as that, as simple as a journal, you know, that's a journal prompt that's daily, a sticky note, selected text that center on character development, all of those things can have a large impact on your student's social emotional development. Okay, so think about the styles and supports that your students need, and I, I think that really comes first. So I know this this looks kind of funny, but at this moment I'm I'm in the midst of looking at some qualitative data. So um, I'm looking at international students' perceptions of student support during the pandemic. I know for me as, a, as an educator, I know how I've been feeling. I can talk to my colleagues about how they've been feeling. I understand, you know, some of the challenges that we faced technology wise, you know, the internet connections, these new things that were brought upon us. Um, but I, I wasn't really sure how students were feeling, you know, we do these check ins, I see the, you know, happy face, whatever, but I really wanted to know what, what are their perceptions of the support that they're being provided I'm very curious. Um, and it ended up being students from high schools, colleges, universities, graduate level. I was very curious about this. And some of them in the spring of this year were already face to face. They were in person. Some were continuing online. I wanted to know how they were connecting with others. I wanted them to express what they thought was missing within this piece. Um, and I know this might not apply to you in any way or your situation, but I'm hoping that maybe you could find some of it useful. So I looked at everything. I looked at what types of support do you have in school? What types of support do you have out of school? How do you connect with your friends? Um, during COVID, what has been a challenge? You know, all of these different questions. Anyways, um, the one thing I wanted to know a little bit more about was what was missing? You know, like now that you told me everything that you have in school, out of school, um, online, what are things that are missing? And so what I found was, you know, they were kind of saying the same things. Um, there were students that just wanted more time to socialize in their online space during school hours. So you can imagine, and maybe you've experienced this, all the side conversations that you had in person are not happening in this online space. The people that you, you know, you have people that you're friends with and, and you just know your acquaintances with, but sometimes it's nice to have a conversation with someone you don't really know, even if it's small, right? So they wanted to have, they wanted to socialize online during the, during the class hours. Um, some returned home. So since they're international students, they returned home overseas, they were attending these live classes in spite of these major time differences. So this was a challenge. How are they being supported? Well, they're not. Um, for new students that began in the school year during COVID, how do they make friends? How do you make a real connection when you're sitting in an online class, listening to a lecture, and then you log off and that's it? And maybe there's a discussion board, or maybe there's an asynchronous piece. So 
So I think it's just being more conscious of of what we're implementing, um, how we can engage students. And then these other resources, I was, you know, I was curious about too for, for in-person. So not knowing about the resources that are available, what are we doing to explicitly tell our students where they can go for support, what types of supports that we have at our school sites, right? Not knowing where the health center is or if one exists, um, and I thought these last two were interesting because they're more social, socially related, right? A physical place where you can just rest. And because of COVID restrictions, there might have been things that were closed, so those spaces were not available. And then where do you go to socialize? Because so many of us were, were banned from, from socializing and group gathering, but they still wanted to have a physical space to connect. So I just wanted to, to also mention that as well. And then for, for all of you to think about, okay, like if there's something that, that you could benefit from, what would it be? You know, what resources do you think would help you during this time? For me, it would be like a coffee bar. I would love that, right? You don't have to make the coffee. All right, so as we come towards the end of this presentation, um, I wanted to end with another strategy of an optimistic closure and ending on a positive note. So this is another practice that you can easily implement um, at the end of the school day, but we should take that initiative as teachers and with something positive. It can be a space to reflect on what you learned. It can be a connection to your personal experiences, um, things that you want to do to move forward, planning your next steps. So if you can, and I know, you know it's hard right now because I can't see anything, but if you can, in one word, drop into the chat what you're feeling at this moment or share something that you've learned and then building off of this think about what you've learned today that you can realistically apply in the near future okay you can write this down on a sticky note post it on your on your you know laptop on your wall somewhere it's just to remind you what is something that you can apply in the near future what is something that you've learned today um, and I, I'm leaving you with this hopeful message because I'm, I really think that we can make a change, even if it's small. And I don't know if there are any questions, but I do have references at the end. Um, and then for my contact information, I am on Twitter and LinkedIn. And these, the credits go to slides go for the beautiful slides. I added the US Department of State and English language programs as well. But um, if there's any questions, please let me know. There aren't any questions, but there are great comments. Uh, our audience was very active during your presentation and um, they they just liked the presentation. They say it was very a very interesting topic that um, we, we don't talk a lot, a lot about this topic here in Honduras. So it's something that we definitely have to explore more. And um, yeah, they just thank you. Thank you so much for for this valuable presentation, like all the information that you shared with us today. Well, thank you. No, thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate the people that did attend because I, I think it's an important piece. It's an important piece that we can easily add into our instruction. Um, it can be incorporated easily within you know language, right? So there's definitely pieces to that as well. So yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you very much again, Dr. Saito, for being here and for our audience too to join, having joined us today. And we invite you to uh, go to our next plenary at 6.30 p.m. and to join us tomorrow too for the next presentations that Dr. Saito has for us. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Have a have good evening. Have a good evening.